Hello and welcome to Total Party Chill. I'm your Dungeon Master Devin. I play the goodies and the baddies. And today we're going to unbox a bunch of new minis from WizKids. Huge shout out to WizKids. Thanks for sending this along. These are the D&D Icons of the Realms of Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse. We got a brick here and we're going to go and open up and see what minis we got. Let you know what they have to say about these characters and monsters. OK, let's get to it. All right, we got a brick of minis here. Let's check them out. Box number one, boom. That's what we got, this is what it looks like on the sides. We're gonna unwrap this later. Okay, let's get to it. This is so funny doing it when you're like not looking at the box. You're like looking at your hands on camera. All right, let's see what we got. Boom. First up, we got the Aramok. Ooh, look at this one. The Aramok. Aramoks were the most powerful and rarest of the real Mani. The uh, real Mani were powerful outsiders who were the living embodiment of pure neutrality. Aramoks are tall, beautiful, and strong humanoids with golden skin. Their eyes glowed so brightly, it's difficult for most creatures to even maintain eye contact. All right, let's see what else we got. <laughs> Ooh, we got a bunch of little rats. A cranium rats or brain vermin, psionically enhanced rats transformed by mind flares uh, through bombardment and psychic energy. Uh, they're used as spies by illithids to intercept through a uh, kind of normal rat population within a city. Cranium rats are indistinguishable from regular rats as their kind of respective species, save from the enlarged and exposed brain. Uh, it was possible for these brains to even emit a light. We also got, let's see. Oh, this is a Romani Kerberlac. Kerberlacs are among some of the most dangerous of the Romani subspecies. Kerberlacs bore a resemblance to humans, uh, but they have this slight, wiry, graceful frames typical to like elves or half elves. Their skin is this coppery metallic color, uh, and they have these featureless ruby red eyes, which emit this purely light. And we got a swarm of sunflies. Sunflies are whimsical buzzing inhabitants of the outer plains. They travel widely and are important indicators of the health of the realm in which they reside. When sunflies struggle, so do the places they inhabit. Sunflies have stingers that they use to inject natural toxins into other creatures. Planar magic can alter a sunfly's toxins so that the effect can be different depending on which outer plane the sunfly is on. Uh, many inhabitants of the plains have strong feelings towards sunflies, viewing them as loathsome pests or adorable pets. Sunflies and sigil are often the pets of doting, highly protective owners. Box number two. All right. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Chateau Demodond. This is the Shador Demodons. Shadors, also known as Shaggy Demodons or Shaggy Less, were the highest ranking of the Demodons. They were the most powerful of the, the spreaders of nihilistic futility, seemingly covered in loosely hanging skins. Shaders were the heaviest and widest of the Demodons, standing around six to 10 feet tall, weighing somewhere between 500 to 700 pounds. They're squat, obese humanoids with large heads, huge bat-like wings, and a pale ooze dripping from their distinguished forms. Uh, they're Massive maws resemble those of a bulldog or fanged frog and drooled a similar slime that exuded from their bodies from the corners. Their common name was actually a misnomer rooted in the fact that the hairless shaggy demodons were draped in overlapping hides. They are also known for their shocking level of cruelty and incredible in how suspicious they are of each other. Uh, they only kind of work together against a very dangerous enemy, but they don't like working together with each other. I love this. All right, let's see what else we got in here. We got... Oh, we got a little centaur. Barriers, barriers, quadrupedal natives of the upper plains, primarily the plain of Asgard and the house of nature. Those unacquainted with a briar was similar to a centaur though, but while a centaur appeared to be a mixture of a human and a horse, a briar is a mixture of human and ram and ewe features. Below the waist, they appear like a powerful ram or ewes, and their torso were similar to those of muscular humans. The males have curling horns emerge from their foreheads, but females do not have horns. Their skin is pale tan to dark brown in color, and while the coats of their lower halves were golden brown, the hooves were cloven. 
Barriars, Barriars? Uh, listen, we're gonna have to figure out how to say this eventually, are huge lovers of freedom and are full of wanderlust. They all feel this desire to defend their homeland planes from evil. Their carefree attitudes sometimes cause those unfamiliar with them to find them irresponsible, but this is simply an outward sign of their wanderlust. When evil showed itself, a Barriers carefree persona was replaced with the focused stance of a hunter. We also got a, ooh, Frostu Demodon. Frostu Demodon, also known as a Terry Demodon or Terry Leth. They're the lowest ranking of Demodons. Uh, they receive their namesake from this tar-like substance that exudes from their unsightly forms, and they're despised by other denizens of Tartarus. Frostus are the most slender of the Demodons. Their bodies are badly emancipated with elongated limbs, long nails, uh, hands, possible wings. Uh, they have these large oblong heads hosted by massive jaws laden with teeth, black, vicus, tar-like substance coating their grotesque frames, constantly oozing and trickling to the ground. And these are incredibly like hateful creatures, angry, vengeful, mostly by their low position of their own society. Despite knowing their purpose from beginning of their existence, their lack of power left them in capable of fulfilling it, leaving them full of resentment. High rank in Demodans persecuted the Frost too, and so when unsupervised, they in turn bullied entities weaker than themselves. Uh, their cruelty and malevolence uh, were allowed to fully manifest when not being watched by their superiors, and escape attempts by their wards were seen as enjoyable opportunities to express their rage. Jeez, these are terrible. Next up we have Razor Vine Blight. Razor Vine Blight. Travelers of Sigil in the Lower Plains take care to avoid Razor Vine, a creeping plant named for its prickly stems and cutting leaves. While Razor Vine is normally a mere environmental nuisance or deterrent, Razor Vine that absorbs the blood of a vampiric passerby can awaken into a terror known as a Razor Vine Blight. Razor Vine Blights lay ambushes on well-traveled paths by standing still to appear like ordinary Razor Vine. When unassuming travelers pass by a seemingly inanimate plant, the Blight strikes, revealing its twisted human-like form lashing out with razor sharp vines to feed its bloodlust. While razor vine blights are usually dangerous in sigils, sometimes they just mimic the behaviors of the other city inhabitants for better or worse. There's at least one blight known as Patch that has spread copies of itself across the city, creating a spy network of copies with this mysterious goal. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got. Oh, we got some robots in here. All right. This, oh, this guy looks fun. Uh, this is Octon. At the head of the Machinist sector are the Octons, the hierarch of Modrons that oversee daily governance. They provide data to other hierarchs, such as productivity reports to the Septons, diagnostic data to the Decatons. Octons have eight mechanical tentacles, which are used to manipulate objects and defend themselves. They even have this kind of like spinning whirlwind of bludgeoning attacks. Now, the Modrons are constructed on the plane of Machinists, and they're partially mechanical beings that belong to a like incredibly strict hierarchy. Each Modron dutifully obeys commands from the rank uh, above it, and then in turn, they're like the superior of any rank below it, passing down commands to the Paragons of Law to the lowliest Monodrone. While most Modrons are lower ranked uh, base Modrons, the upper tier uh, hierarch Modrons hold leadership positions, maintaining order in Machinus and the realms beyond. Then we also got... Boom. Ooh, we got a nice little dwarf, and he's got some nice red armor on. Harmonium Peacekeeper. Peacekeepers wear these distinctive red plate armor and wield planar man catchers. Pole arms whose metal pinchers prevent criminals clamped in their grasp from teleporting away, making them excellent at catching wrongdoers in sigil. Awesome, and then we got Hands of Havoc Firestarter. These pyromaniacal agents known as Firestarters burn away oppressive systems through chaos and flame. They wield hammers that emit magical flames that are perfect for smashing and burning. These are just like little agents of anarchy. Lastly, we have Cranium Rats in Disguise. This is awesome. I've already talked about the Cranium Rats, but this is when they work as like a humanoid and they'll do this to collect information. This is very much like your three kobolds in a trench coat, except it's just a hundred Cranium Rats in a tattered cloak. It's absolutely gross. I love it. Box number four. Get these out of the way. Oh, 
Now this is dope. I haven't seen a lot of these. Uh, this is a uh, Melephant, uh, spelled like malicious. Look at this one. This is a Malephant. They're elephantine denizens of the Nine Hells and powerful guardians used to protect treasure of fiends and wicked spellcasters. Melephants, they're vaguely human in shape, but around like nine feet tall. <laughs> they're these bewildering creatures, but nonetheless terrifying, with these oversized hands tipped with vicious claws. They have these massive heads that resemble that of an elephant with smaller eyes, ears, teeth, and mouths. And they have this kind of uh, roomy red eyes and a serpentine trunk ending a long, narrow spike. Malephants are these instinctually loyal beings that were created with a primal urge to protect. They have no possessions of their own, and they'll wander the lower plains like searching for things to guard. So if they have nothing to guard, they're going to go out and find something, which is such a fun idea for a creature in like any campaign. And they also are able to breathe this like long cloud of noxious gas. And if the gas comes into contact with your skin, it could repress your memories. I love this. Okay. We also got, ooh, this looks like a spider or something. Oh, this is a uh, dark weaver. Arachnid predator, dark weavers, arachnid predators of the Shadowfell, dark weavers inhabit caves, dungeons, and other kind of dark locales throughout the multiverse, including under sigil and the whimps of darkness of pandemonium. Uh, dark weavers lurk in the shadows of its lair, waiting for hapless prey to pass by. When a target approaches, the dark weaver fires a web of pure shadow at the quarry and then drags the victim into darkness. Now, dark weavers are fascinated by sensations, particularly taste and how creatures from across the plains experience reality. For them, the act of eating is an experience to be drawn out and savored with every meal considered in all of its facets. Whether it's fair as demon, archon, archon, or struggling halfling or catatonic mule, all such meals are a culinary delight for a dark weaver served up in a cosmic kitchen that is the multiverse. Uh, these spider-like terrors appreciate secondhand descriptions of sensations especially by those they're unlikely to experience it in their home environment. A dark weaver's captive might delay being consumed by sharing tales of its experiences, particularly great meals with the monster. Some might even convince a dark weaver to release them if they promise to return with a rare species or a one of a kind meals. This is a foodie spider. This is a sentient spider that is a foodie that you can get out of dying by telling it like, I will introduce you to the Big Mac. I will introduce you to a, a three-star Michelin meal. I love this. Okay, next up we got, ooh, uh, we got a Demi-Lich. A Demi-Lich hides its earthy remains and treasures in a labyrinth tomb guarded by monsters and traps. At the heart of this labyrinth rests the Demi-Lich's skull and the dust from its other bones. The immortality granted to a Lich lasts only as long as it feeds mortal souls to its phylactery. And if it falters or fails at that task, its, its bones just turn to dust until only the skull remains. And this is a demi lich, and it contains only a fragment of the lich's malevolent life force, just enough that if it's disturbed, these remains rise into the air and assume a wraith like form. The skull then emits this kind of terrifying howl uh, that can slay the weak hearted and leave others trembling in fear. Left alone, it sinks back down and returns to its empty piece of existence. Now, few liches seek to become demi-liches, for it means an end to the existence they hope to preserve by becoming undead. However, time can erode the lich's reason and memory, causing it to retreat into an ancient tomb and forget to feed on souls. The spells it once knew fade from its mind and it no longer channels the arcane energy it wielded as a lich. However, even as a mere skull, it remains a deadly and vexing enemy. So this is kind of like a lich who kind of like lost its way. It's a sad lich. This is an orphan lich, if you will. All right, and lastly we have, oh, this guy's dope. This is uh, Doomguard Rotblade, also the name of my band. The Doomguard Rotblade. Rotblades are entropic levers uh, through which the Doomguard quickens the natural decay of the multiverse. Uh, these members wield weapons immersed in necrotic energy, which can turn their enemies to ash. Also, they look dope as hell. Look at this. We got four boxes left. Let's check this one out. Ooh, okay. You have Warden Archon, which is a bear humanoid. 
Warden Archons are vigilant earth sign guardians of portals and paths connected to goodly realms. They have powerful built bipedal bodies with the heads of great bears and eyes with pools of silvery light. When Warden Archons speak, glimmering radiance shines from within their mouths, punctuating their deep resonant voices. A Warden Archon knows when a creature uses a portal that the Archon is tasked to guard, and it moves swiftly to interrogate any who cross that planar boundary. If an invader enters the Archon's plane, the Warden strikes the claw and tooth using its powerful bite to magically mark the intruder, which the Archon then can pursue relentlessly. Now, Archons are the denizens of the seven heavens of Mount Celestia. Uh, created by the powers of order and benevolence, Archons defend their home from fiendish incursions and safeguard those threatened by wicked forces. Archons are skilled communicators able to speak all languages of the multiverse, and when pushed into combat, they prefer to subdue foes rather than kill them. However, against fiends, Archons are wrathful combatants, manifesting a righteous vengeance of Mount Celestia to strike down the wicked. We also got a, ooh, uh, Mesoloth. I might have butchered the, the pronunciation. Mesoloth. The bulk of Yagnaloth population is made up of Mesoloths, which are these human-sized insect creatures covered in dense, chitinous plate. Mesoloths are like the foot soldiers of the Yagnaloth armies. They got these like wide-set eyes that kind of glow red. Violence and reward are like the fundamental things that drive these fiends. Uh, a powerful being that promises one or the other can easily attract them into their service. Now, even though they have these two sets of claws um, or four sets, the Mesoloth typically wields a trident uh, in each set of hands. And if surrounded by enemies, they can exhale this toxic fume that can choke out an entire group of creatures. Three boxes left. Let's see. We got, oh, we got another one of these guys. Again, still love him. I think he's great. And ooh, well, there's maybe I missed one from the other one. I feel like maybe I got a bonus one. Kelubar Demodon. Kelubars, sometimes called slimy Demodons, are the bureaucrats of uh, Karsiri, existing as intermediaries between the uh, Ferastus and the uh, Shators. Their squat, their skin kind of drips with foul smelling acid and slime. Kelubars revel in subservience of others, and they prefer to do battle with words or at least to send in their Ferastu minions rather than fight directly. We got a Varguli reflection. Dude, Varguli, are, oh my God, this one has a little chef's hat. Vugulis are flying fiends that resemble disembodied human heads with wings. While most of Vargulis roam the plains to curse humanoids and create more Vargulis, a variant known as the Varguli reflection resides in under sigil. When a Varguli reflection spots a humanoid target, it takes on that creature's visage, terrifying that creature by appearing as its own disembodied head. Which I love that they, if for this one, they're using like a chef has been what um, they've taken over the visage of. And it looks like a Chef Boyardee type of chef with the mustache and the, the tall hat. We got two left here. Ooh, okay. We got a monodrone. Monodrones are beings of absolute law that adhere to a hive-like hierarchy. They inhabited the plane in Mechanus and are always kind of tending to the eternal revolving gears of that plane. And they kind of exist in this clockwork routine of perfect order. Under the direction of their Liber Primus, Modrons increase order in the multiverse in the accordance with the laws beyond the comprehension of mortal minds. Their own minds are networked into this hierarchical pyramid in which each Modron receives commands from their superiors and delegates orders to his underlings. And Modrons carry out commands with total obedience, utmost efficiency, and the absence of mortality or ego. Uh, Modrons have no sense of self beyond what is necessary to fulfill their duties. They exist in this unified collective divided by rank. They always refer to themselves collectively. To a Motron, there is no I, there is only we and us. Definitely like the cogs in the machine. And then we have a, oh, a duo drone. Look at this little guy. Uh, the blocky duo drones are the supervisor units for the mono drones. If the reason why they're the supervisors is they can perform two tasks at a time, rather the mono drone can only perform one. All right, we got two left. Let's do this one. Open. This is my favorite. Ooh, who are you? Shemeshka's bodyguard. 
This one is actually really interesting because its name, Eater of Knowledge. They're originally created by the Mind Flayer God Brain and are now produced by some of that God's followers. Eaters of Knowledge are lumbering bipedal masses of squelching muscles and exposed brain matter. These hulking creatures collect information from others by devouring brains before returning to their masters with delicious secrets. Unlike Illithids, which overwhelm their foes with psionic powers, Eaters of Knowledge just use their physical strength to hold their prey while they have these tentacles just kind of crack the brain open and consume the brain. Consuming brains actually fuel these brood's psionic powers, making Eaters of Knowledge deadlier after each brain they've consumed. All right, then we got, oh, it's like a slot machine. Modron slot machine. These are like duo drones that are slot machines. They're specifically in the schemes in Sigil where you can go to a casino uh, and they have these indifferent duo drones. I absolutely love when I was reading about this that there's like a night hag that is just like jamming on a duo drone slot machine when you first come into the slot machine section of the casino. Then we got, oh, an angel batter. Okay, so this comes from same Planescape Adventure. Uh, this is the Angels in the Outlands. So about every 300 years, the Celestials and the Fiends gather to play a ball game in observance of an ancient agreement between God and a demon lord. And the victors of the match claim a priceless trophy, the fate of an innocent soul. This is uh, Shariel, the star player on the Righteous Hands, which is the baseball team of the Angels. And it's not really baseball, it's called Spireball, uh, but it's obviously like this is a baseball thing. Um, it's really funny too, because they have this like mace-like bat that they, they swing with. And we got one left. Let's see what we got. Ooh, Bernaloth, Bernaloth, Bernaloth. Bernaloths are these tall, gaunt Yolaths that keep uh, to the gray wastes of Hades. Um, their gray, desiccated skin stretches over their bones, and their heads kind of resemble this horn equine skulls with ember-like eyes. The sages endlessly debate the nature of Barnalos and the Book of Keeping, these ancient tombs that detail the true names of the first Yugolos. The report no mention of Baranoths within. Some posit that these enatic Yugolos were created by primal evil power before other Yugolos, or that they came from the Epoch, before the current manifestation of the planes. Baranalos refused to say, but most obsess over the secrets and obscene lore regarding the far-flung past of the inscrutable future of the multiverse. Many of these rare scholars of the profane seek to manipulate reality on a grand scale, while others unleash horrific experiments on the plains. Uh, it is said the first of the Demodons of Karsi were created by Baranalos. Baranalos spread discord and despair among any creature they meet. They use their breath, thick with this gloom of Hades, to turn friends against each other. Baranalos used this wicked power to keep mortally wounded foes alive, sometimes indefinitely, to prolong their suffering. Even striking against a Baranalos brings misery. They can cause the attacker's old wounds to painfully reopen, all while the Baranalos are disturbingly detached, observing the victim's agony without emotion. These guys suck. Last one in our mix, we have a Doomguard Doom Lord. Ooh. Doomguard Doom Lord. Doom Lords are the highest ranking members of the Doom Guard, embodying the multiverse's inevitable collapse into dust. The mere presence of a Doom Lord could snuff out the life from weaker creatures, and even the status walls will just crumble before them. They kind of have this uh, entropic powers uh, that they're able to wield. They are considered siege monsters. It deals double damage to any kind of object or structure. All right, so then we have as a, as a bonus, the Whirlworm. Now this is uh, the one that's advertised on the side. This is great. Oh, these are the other ones you can maybe see in here. All right, let's go ahead and open this one up. Look at this guy. Okay, so the chapter of the Mosaic uh, Mimir, on the, near the gate of Isgard, there are these creatures called whirlworms, and this is an elder one. It took a while to kind of like dig into this because there's not a stat block for it. You're actually supposed to be using the giant crocodile stat block for this creature. I actually would rather give it something else because it's such a, an amazing miniature. In the adventure, you need to get uh, the fang of this creature. It causes these kind of maelstorms if you get close to it. 
Now, if you want to continue to support the show, go ahead and uh, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Total Party Chill so we can keep doing the stuff that we're doing. If you want to connect with other folks who love the show, you can check out our Discord community with other folks who love the show. Or you can just share with your friends. Uh, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies. That is the best way you can help us grow. Thank you again so much for your support. Make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you soon. Perfect. And that's everything.